By 1931, Leroy Satchel Page was already black baseball's first cult hero. He wasn't quite a superstar yet because he pitched in the purgatory that was the Southern black baseball, but for Page, Baseball was a means for personal survival. Born in Mobile, Alabama in 1906 in a shotgun shack without any plumbing, he would first pick up baseball while in reform school after he was remanded for five years for stealing jewelry. He got his nickname as a youth for stealing satchels from unwary travelers traveling through the Mobile Railroad Station. He got his first start in the semi-pro Chattanooga Black Lookouts and then moved into the Negro leagues for the Birmingham Black Barons. Page fastball was so unfathomably powerful that he made up for his lack of a curveball. His auxiliary pitch was a hesitation pitch that Page would hesitate at the top of delivery just before the moment of completing the throw and hit it with stride forward to meet a non-existent pitch. Page was also a great promoter and would make headlines for simply for names for his various pitches. No matter what the name was, whether it be Long Tom or the Trouble Ball or the Bat Dodger, the pitch was always the same. Page's slow gait, his double pump windups, and his habit for getting to the park at the last minute could be seen as pandering to the image white America had made up for people of color, but Page didn't care because he was only here to make a name for himself. Page was so coveted by many teams that he made a lucrative industry of leaving as fast as he could agree to a contract. Page had no guilt because the predatory behavior practiced by club owners in black baseball discouraged player loyalty. Page was a black man who became an authentic celebrity in the South. R.T. Jackson, owner of the Black Barons, knew he could not crimp Page's personality, so he would pimp out Page to other teams, renting him out for a few days or a week with the two divided the money between them. In 1931, Jackson leached out Page to the Baltimore Black Sox and suddenly Page was shunned as a hick. He would return to Birmingham just as the club was about to go out of business along with the entire Negro League. America was now in the depths of the Great Depression. Racial superiority had no meaning when you were starving and an inexpensive form of entertainment was needed to take their mind off that financial situation, especially in the Dust Bowl of the Depression. The future of black baseball would be in the Midwest and J.L. Wilkerson would cultivate routes to keep the Kansas City Monarchs alive as the Negro League fell apart. And by 1931, Wilkerson dropped out of the league to concentrate on barnstorming rural towns. J.L. Wilkerson will recruit much of the money that he blew in the first Negro League by setting up his own terms on these tours. He would often make half on the gate and often as much as 80 or 90 percent. It wasn't a racial wonderland either. The same people that would cheer for talented black players on the field will refuse to serve them at gas stations and restaurants. But still, Wilkerson made black baseball viable in a time of the Depression, equalizing black and white fortunes and continued to navigate navigate the economic realities and turn a profit. With the Kansas City Monarchs dropping out of the Negro National League, this was the end for the Negro National League. Within a year of the Monarchs leaving, the Negro National League would fold up completely. Most of the black clubs would simply return back to independent barnstorming, but during the 30s, a new team would ascend seemingly out of nowhere by the name of the Homestead Grays, owned by a man by the name of Cumberland Willis Posey. Cumberland Jr. was born in June 20th, 1890 in Homestead, Pittsburgh. He was a gifted athlete and it opened many doors for him in his life. He was captain of the golf, baseball, and basketball team at Penn State and Holy Cross College. And at the same time, he played semi-pro basketball and baseball under the pseudonym of Charles W. Cumbert to protect his amateur status. But Posey always craved more than simply playing on the field. As early as 1911, at only 20, he would operate a black semi-pro basketball team, the Monticellos, with his brother. And inevitably, he would turn his sights towards black baseball, playing center field for the then only two-year-old Homestead Grays. Posey would begin booking the Grays games as the nature of the team began to change. Originally, they were created as a spare time amusement for black steel workers, first 
under the name of the Blue Ribbons, then the Murdoch Grays. Posey devised a co-op plan to allow them to turn pro by having the players share in the costs and the gate receipts. By 1913, the Grays won 47 games in a row, but their financial situation was in peril because their current owners refused to play games on Sunday. By 1915, the owners had sold the team to Charles Walker, and he lifted those restrictions and made Cumberland Posey the team captain. And then in 1918, he became the team's manager. When the team signed 50-year-old Smokey Joe Williams from the New York Lincoln Giants, he gave them instant credibility. He began his career in the 1800s, but was still had a sinking fastball and was said to scare hitters with only a stare. In 1914, he went an unverifiable 41-3 and with 15 20-plus strikeout gains and going 6-4 and versus white major league teams. The Grays would take the next step and begin in engaging in barnstorming against white teams. Of course, in black baseball fashion, the team would boast of their team's accolades and in 1925, Posey claimed that the Grays won 130 out of 158 games. In 1926, he claimed they won 34 games in a row. By this point, Posey had turned over managing the team to Vic Harris so he could concentrate more on the business end of the club. He had also increased his equity in the team and was now a 50% owner. The Grays' achievement was not go unnoticed by the Negro League and the Eastern Colored League, and they both were eager to enlist profitable teams, but Posey felt disdain for both Rue Foster and Ed Bolding, seeing them as weak men to be devoured by men like himself. He had no desire to shed power, and like Ed Bolden and J.R. Wilkerson, Posey believed that powerful black men could be achieved with accommodation with whites. In fact, the Grays played very few games versus black teams. He even threatened white clubs if they played against other black teams, they would lose their dates against the Grays. Most people within black baseball and outside of the Grays viewed Cumberland Posey with disdain. They felt like he was a menace to the sport, and even among his own team, he was a strange role model. He represented himself as a Boy Scout, banning even card games in the locker room. But even though he was married, he would openly flaunt his womanizing, even joking about it. When the two Negro team, when the two Negro leagues attempted to woo him, he saw it as a chance to drive a hard bargain and suggested the Grays play two games a month against two Negro League teams at Forbes Field, one from each league as a way to bridge competition between the two circuits, but insisted that the Grays stay independent. Quickly, Ed Bolden of the Eastern League backed off and the Negro League lost interest. When Bolden came to him again with plans for the American Negro League in 1929, Posey accepted the invitation, misreading the current of black baseball, and the league, of course, folded within months. In 1931, after both Negro Leagues had folded, many had given up on the viability of a black baseball league, but Posey had not. He viewed the Grays and J.L. Wilkerson's Monarchs as the only team that could survive the cruelties of the Depression. But when no one took him up on his offer to save black baseball, he concluded he had to save the game himself. In 1931, the Homestead Grays had a cornucopia of stars on the contract. Judy Johnson, Alfreda Cool Papa Bell, pitcher Bill Foster, third baseman Judd Wilson, but none of them had the popularity of rising prodigy Josh Gibson. Well, while Judd Wilson was built like Babe Ruth, Gibson had his power. At only 19 in 1931, Gibson was already creating a level playing field with the white major leagues. Posey states that Gibson hit 65 home runs in 1930 and 72 home runs in 1931. And while these numbers are almost impossible to verify, there are enough of counts from those games to make the home runs seem like the numbers could be plausible. One of the Negro players would state Gibson sent a ball clear out of Yankee Stadium, something that no other human has ever done. And from this point, Gibson would be known as the Black Bay Bruce. At 6'2", 220 pounds, he had almost no stride into the pitch. Most of his power was generated from his waist. He was able to get his hips and his arms into the swing and send balls on a slow rising trajectory. Most of his home runs were line drives that rose no more than 20 feet off the ground. Gibson was born in Buena Vista, Georgia, and his family moved to Pittsburgh during the Great Migration. And during his teenage years, he and his father worked in a coal mines. He would start playing sandlot ball, and before long, he played on the city's top semi-pro team, the Crawford Giants. The Crawford Giants were a stepping stone to big-time black baseball when Cumberland Posey began to recruit their best players for the Homestead Grays. 
in July of 1930, the call came for Josh Gibson. The legend has it that Gibson was sitting in the stands when Posey called him into the game against the Kansas City Monarchs. They would portray Gibson as an easygoing kid with the appetite of an elephant and ready catch phrases like a homer a day will boost my pay. I don't break bats. I wear them out. But the real Gibson was not like the caricature. Unbeknownst to his teammates, he had a 17-year-old wife named Helen Mason who lived in Bedford Avenue, and in August of 1930, she gave birth to twins, Josh Jr. and Helen Gibson. She would have convulsions during delivery, which would result in kidney failure, and she lapsed to a coma and died a couple hours later. Gibson decided after that tragedy that he would avoid personal relationships that might end in a similar pain. He was cold and short with everyone, even his young children who were raised by Helen's mother. They rarely saw Josh. They rarely saw Josh Gibson, who chose to play baseball year round, spending his winter in the Caribbean rather than assuming his role as a father in Pittsburgh. Baseball would provide a refuge for his insecurities, but would even manifest himself in his play because Josh Gibson felt like he needed to hit every ball over the fence unless he would be branded a failure. Later in his life, these issues would lead to strange and reckless behavior. But for right now, Josh Gibson would continue to wear out bats and pitchers. By the spring of 1932, Cumberland Posey was ready to unveil his plan for a viable Negro League. He called it the East-West League. He intended the circuit to be an all-inclusive black league on two fronts that would extend its tentacle into the Midwest. Posey modeled his league after Fossil's autocracy, commanding enrollment of low-level clubs like the Cleveland Stars, the New York Browns, the Washington Pilots, and even more established clubs like the Hillsdale's Field Club, the Baltimore Black Sox, and the Cuban Stars. The inclusion of the Hillsdale Club meant that Nathaniel Strong was once again in black baseball. Although he had lost nearly all of his black interests, maintaining only his booking connections, he formed a business arrangement with Philadelphia promoter Eddie Gottlieb. Mr. Basketball himself, but with Strong, he was able to amass a title to a baseball field in Philly and collect 5% off any game and 10% whenever a black team played a white team on the premises. The Grays would strike a more favorable terms with Godlip in Philly, but no other team in the East West League could. Teams like the Hilldales, who had been taken over by John Drew, a wealthy Delaware politician from Ed Bolden in 1931, couldn't even book teams in Philly or New York because Godlip and Strong had a deal to split the fee on all games played on their fields. In addition, when the Black Yankees were formed by Bill Bojangles Robinson in 1931, this meant that Strong had the use of Yankee Stadium for select dates and would collect 10% off the top of some huge crowds. Posey wanted those crowds to see the Grays in non-league games, so he had to work with Godlip and Strong. John Drew was the first to attempt to rebel against Godlip in Philadelphia and Strong in New York because of how bad the Hillsdale attended had fallen. In July 18th of 1932, only 196 fans showed up and Drew simply folded the team after that for good. Meanwhile, Posey had the same issues as Foster. He had chained himself into his office, wrote the schedules for the teams, hired the umpires, put together a deal for black radio stations to broadcast games, and even hired an outside agency to compile stats. The Detroit Wolves were on the cusp of going bankrupt, and Posey kept pumping funds into the team. But by mid-July, the Wolves disintegrated, and all the other teams in the league outside of the Grays were on the verge of dying, so he simply terminated the East-West League. The only winners in this league was, of course, Nathaniel Strong and Ed Godlip, who had used the league to play on the same stage as the Homestead Grays. And now there was a new player in black baseball, a man by the name of Gus Greenlee. William Gus Greenlee bought the Pittsburgh Crawford Giants in 1930. The Crawfords were the same Sandlot team that unearthed Josh Gibson, but Greenlee used them as a front to hide his number rackets on his accounting books. He wanted to construct a shield for his numbers business that he had been running out of the Hills District in Pittsburgh. Born in 1897 in Marion, North Carolina, Gus's mother was the illegitimate daughter of a prominent white businessman and his black mistress. His skin color, similar to Cumberland Posey's, was light skin and that, and that carried a certain bit of privilege. One of his brothers was a doctor and the other was a lawyer, but Gus dropped out of college to travel to Pittsburgh in 1916. He worked as a fireman, a cab driver, an undertaker, and even served in World War I, and even served in World War I for the black 
367th Regiment where he was wounded in France. But once he reached home, he used his cab to bootleg liquor for gambling dens and brothels around Pittsburgh and Homestead. Greenlee got the name of Big Red because of his red hair and because of his monstrous size. And he was soon able to open a speakeasy, the Paramount Club on Wiley Avenue in the Hills District and soon promoted dance bands for other clubs. And by the 30s, he was able to open two more clubs, the Sunset Cafe and the Crawford Grill. Greenlee saw black men involved in vice as a chance for respect and power. And in a non-aggression pact, Greenlee paid respect to the white mob. But in his own turf, he had no bosses. He had no bosses because they needed his aid and they pledged to leave Gus's numbers business alone. Gus's success lay large in his mystery and character. Anyone that crossed him for power would soon find themselves at the bottom of a river. But when the Steel City Bank, the only bank in the Hills District, went bankrupt in 1925, Greenlee would become the only bank in the area, offering numerous interest-free loans to small black businesses and social causes. Greenlee's interest in black baseball grew out of a watchful eye at the gaze of his business. Gus knew little about baseball or any other game outside of the game of numbers, but when the promoters of the Crawford Giants ran out of money, Greenlee agreed to make a charitable contribution and bought the team. His obsession for the game quickly took over and learned about the money tree that Cumberland Posey had created in the Homestead Grays and threw himself into the Crawford Giants. By the 1930, Greenlee was ready to challenge Cumberland Posey in the area and the Crawford Giants had made a home at Armand Field and this was the only place to watch baseball in the entire Hills District. Armand brought crowds and fans and gamblers and Greenlee celebrity pals. The ballpark was a social scene and the rise of the Crawfords and the black press began to press the Crawfords and the Grays to play on the same field and the teams finally met in their first contest in July 14th of 1930. In 1930, the Grays won in their first meeting of the historic contest, 3-2, to two, but when the two teams met in 1931, the Crawfords suffered a devastating defeat and a 9-0 loss, and this made Greenlee almost maniacal about the idea of cutting Posey down the size. Russell began replacing Greenlee's Crawford players with more seasoned black ball players, and by August of 1931, Satchel Page was put on a Crawford uniform, and his first game versus the Grays on Forest Field. Page didn't start, but he came in relief of Harry Kincaid in the fourth. Crawford Center fielder Harry Tinker will recall that the Grays could hardly hit a foul ball off a of satchel and the Grays broke the game open and won 11-7 with the victory went to Page. With Satchel Page on the moves, so was Josh Gibson, but getting him in a Crawford's uniform was not so simple. Gibson had resigned with the Grays just a day before, before Greenlee offered his contract, offering him a full hundred dollars more than Cumberland Posey. Gibson had no qualms about signing his con second contract in two days, but Cumberland Posey was, was so irate about this betrayal, he tried to reason with Gibson, but Gibson didn't change his mind, so he began to blast Gibson in the press, stating that he would not play in Pittsburgh and today's baseball was a business. When the Crawfords opened the 1932 season versus Bodengo's Robinson's Black New York Yankees, the mayor of Pittsburgh showed up, the entire city council, the county commissioners were all in attendance. The Crawfords lost that game, but it didn't matter because they were able to showcase Satchel Page and Josh Gibson came up in the ninth and sent a shot over center field that was caught in the fence for the last out. While Greenlee was a tough guy, Posey took the route of deceit. When Greenlee attempted to enter the short league East-West League, Posey only agreed if he could create the Crawford schedule and his brother Stuart Posey would become the team's manager. But when the East-West League collapsed, Greenlee got the upper hand. Greenlee was overextended, but watching Posey free fall put a smile on his face and it forced Posey to schedule games with the Crawfords to make up for the lost profits from the East-West League. Posey was having a hard time even getting nine men on the field because his players had either left to play for Greenlee or quit because he couldn't pay them. Greenlee and the Crawfords, on the other hand, started barnstorming in April of 1932 with mythic list of black baseball players, Satchel Page, Josh Gibson, Cool Papa Bell, Judy Johnson, and Oscar Charleston. 
The team played 92 games within 109 games throughout July, and Greenlee would gloat that his team's only loss was in a two-game series against the Black Yankees and the Grays. By the end of the 1932 season, Greenlee was ready to support the idea of a Negro League, but with a few differences designed to avoid the failures of the past. A Negro League, he felt, needed to be black outside of name only. There needed to be an economic foundation and a black capitalism at the gate to be taken seriously taking note of the rise of the black turnout at big league games in philadelphia he felt like he could take advantage of that in a negro league Greenlee was also able to get the attention of the Chicago American Giants and the Detroit Stars, but both clubs had passed in the white hands. It was a sad irony that Rue Foster's old club was now owned by a white mortuary owner by the name of Robert Cole, and Greenlee faced the same problem as Cumberland Posey and that he couldn't book games in Philadelphia or New York without an agreement with Ed Gottlieb or Nate Strong. Rather than deal with the devil, he chose to leave those two markets out of his plans forcing him to offer league membership to Cumberland Posey in the favorable market of the Homestead Grays. The losses of the East-West League had left Cumberland Posey with no place to say no, and it seemed as if he was buying himself time and aligning himself with Greenlee while looking for, while looking for an opportunity to potentially embarrass Greenlee down the road. In February 1933, Greenlee and his delegates from six other teams met at Crawford's Grill to ratify the constitution of the National Organization of Professional Baseball Clubs. But once again, one team was missing, the Kansas City Monarchs. The Monarchs had split into several different mutations by 1932. A traveling team that features would be its inhabitants of the major club. And when the Monarchs showed up in the town, locals didn't know which team they would see. And it did it didn't matter because they were rigging up profits at all the different mutations of the team and J.L. Wilkerson had no interest in working with the brand new Brew Foster. So Gus Greenlee had to be satisfied with opening the first season of the second National Negro League with a lineup of lightweight clubs of the Columbus Bluebirds, the reorganized Indianapolis ABCs and the Detroit Stars. Greenlee knew that the first season would be rough, so he slashed ticket prices to make the game more palatable to black fans. And he created a Negro League all-star game, Chris in the East-West game, and it will be played at Kaminsky Park in Chicago. The players will be chosen by ballots distributed by black newspapers. The huge social leap in black baseball was indicative of the change in mindset in black culture that it represented himself in a sudden fever amongst urban blacks that frequented major league parks. This wave in black nationalism started in the 1920s with the Harlem Renaissance and with authors like Langston Hughes and Alan Locke, but also extended to music and now black sports. African Americans could take immense pride in Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson's breakthrough into the white mainstream. Gus Greenlee was also so great friends with John Henry Lewis and his association had tremendous implications for black baseball. For years, Greenlee tried to get Lewis to buy a Negro League team, but it never happened. But Lewis was a regular at Crawford games and even appeared as an umpire for a few games. These powerful associations with famous black African-Americans didn't just extend to Lewis, but to Bojangles Robinson and Lewis Armstrong. By the 30s, black baseball had a tradition that would fit comfortably within a larger American baseball tradition. And some in black baseball saw that game as superior to the white game at a similar stage in their development. Development. In the first season of the second Negro League, the Columbus Bluebirds didn't survive. And once again, the dream of a uniform schedule fell victim to the same stadium problems and travel expenses of past Negro Leagues. Greenlee was able to obtain prime coverage in black papers, with standing published weekly and stat charts displaying the top four hitters from each club. The biggest jolt to the league came from Cumberland Posey looking for a way to get back at his rival, brazenly raided Detroit Star. Stars, a team that had taken territory left by Posey by the dead Detroit Wolves and took two players for the Homestead Grays. Gus Greenlee would call a meeting of the owners and suspend the grades, but the damage was done. Posey refused to return the two players and officially pulled out of the league, taking his dying team back to independent baseball. And even after these transgressions and his exit from the Negro League, Cumberland Posey knew that he would have to deal with Gus Greenlee again. 
as the East West game became near, 1.5 million ballots arrived from local papers and the top vote getters being aging heroes like Turkey Stearns and Oscar Charleston, with newcomers like Satchel Page and Job Gibson being at the bottom of the list. Even before the game, the event had grown in huge significance with over 20,000 fans showing up to Kaminsky Park to see Bill Foster of the East team route left streeter of the West team at 11-7. The post-game story of the East-West game was bigger than the game itself, with reporters saying we saw a baseball epic unfold on historic field this afternoon, with them calling it a diamond masterpiece. This was a game. This was no baseball classic. The profits from the game were divided up between the three team owners, with 2500 going to the park owners, the Chicago White Sox, and the players only receiving travel expenses. At this stage of black baseball, though, no one complained because the reward was playing in the game itself. The problem for the East-West game was that it offered a climax for the season and took the wind out of the rest of the season. The aftermath, the tenders dwindled throughout the league, and consequently, Gus Greenlee would not carry out his plans for a playoffs. Although this decision was not made until the Crawfords had rallied to win their second half title on the last day of the season. Greenlee had not formed a circuit to play a World Series like the majors, but he did prove that black businessmen could make a profit in baseball, and for this reason, the Negro League was here to stay. During the 1934 season, the league would add two new teams from Nathaniel Strong, both in big markets, the Philadelphia Stars and the Newark Dodgers. With the Philadelphia Stars, Green League would once again have to deal with Ed Godlip, and the Stars would mark the return of Ed Bolden to black baseball, if only as a figurehead, with Godlip being the real man behind the club. Godlip bankrolled the Philadelphia Stars club, club but had enlisted Bolden to purchase a minor interest and assume the guise of being the club's majority owner. Ed in his war with Rube Foster helped bring him down, but Nate Strong kept him in business. 1934 was amazing for Greenlee. Satchel Paige was at the peak of his career. Gus rang in huge crowds and headlines all season long, but the issue was that Paige failed to remain with the Crawfords long enough for the team to hit a stride. Paige would appear on Sunday, but as soon as he left the mound, he'd be off to his next gig, whatever team he was cashing in on. League solidarity and loyalty meant nothing to Paige. He was going to do his own thing and kept his teammates miles apart so that Greenlee had to arrange outside gigs for Paige just so they could split the fees but to keep him on the leash for as long as he could. Paige's constant absence, even through approved by the owners, cost the team league victories and allowed the American Giants to win the first half title in 1934. With the East-West game coming up soon, Greenlee was worried that Paige would miss the game for some random semi-pro event. Paige had no use for Negro League formalities, and as long as he felt like he was bigger than the black game itself, and even though he brought in huge crowds, the other players were brewed about Paige's greed. By the end of the 1934 season, the Philadelphia Stars won the first Negro League title, clinching the game over the Chicago American Giants in the league's first ever playoffs with their star pitcher, Stuart Slim Jones, winning 25 games during that season. But at the end of the 1934 season, Satchel Paige turned his attention to the Dakotas, and it wasn't until Ted Ratliff, a riding buddy for Paige's time in Mobile, Alabama, joined the Pittsburgh Crawfords in 1934. But midway through the season, Ratliff walked out on Green League and took an offer to play for a semi-pro team in Jamestown, North Dakota. The team was already full of ex-Negro League players and Ratliff seduced Paige to jump from the Crawfords to finish the season with him with the integrated league in Bismarck, North Dakota. The offer was $400 for a month's work and any automobile off the lot of the team owner's used car lot. Greenlee would tolerate this defection since the season was almost over and Page kept his promise to return to the East-West game, but he was worried about Page might be on his way out. In an attempt to buy his loyalty, when Page married Janet Howard, a waitress from the Crawford Grill in the fall of 1935, Greenlee would host a reception at the Crawford's Grill that lasted all night and had three big bands, a tap dance show hosted by Bojangles Robinson, who was Page's best man. During Page's reception, Gus Greenlee was a contract with the same $350 a month he had been making the year before under a very, very drunk Page who scribbled on it, not knowing what he was signing. When Page sobered up, he realized what Greenlee had done. He immediately walked and accepted another offer from Neil or Churchill from the team in Bismarck, North Dakota. 
Page was making a ton of money, but he was a man without a country. Once Bismarck reached the crest of small time baseball, Churchill jettisoned the star after hearing of Page's tale of entertaining white women in his trailer on the edge of town. Churchill went on to become the mayor of Bismarck, but Page was cast aside from black baseball. In violation of his Crawford contract, Greenlee banned him from life from the Negro National League, and he had no reason to lift the ban since he was making tons of money without Page. The Crawfords without Page won 26 of 32 games to win their first half title over the Elite Giants, but Greenley was winning in all areas because Cumberland Posey of the Homestead Grays had been relegated to the sticks of black baseball without league membership or competition. By 1935, Cumberland Posey humbled himself and petitioned for re-entry in the Negro League. J.O. Wilkinson, believing that Greenley had gone soft and had no real fangs, decided to breach the gentleman's agreement in the no raid clause. Bertram Hunter from the Crawfords, Sam Bankhead from the Lee Giants, and Turkey Stearns from the American Giants. The Black Papers would attack J.L. Wilkerson for wading to the flag races at its hottest and in cases undecided before grabbing players from competing teams. Once again, Greenlee would have the last laugh because he would pay more to the players. And by 1935, every single player had returned to the league while J.L. Wilkerson maintained a very long distance away from Greenlee. Meanwhile, Cumberland Posey who was back in the league, but still believed that he could outdo Gus Greenlee. So he brought in a new co-owner by the name of Rufus Sunnyman Jackson, the numbers king of Homestead. It was the kind of person that Posey would have rejected in his past. He was able to speak Greenlee's language in the league meetings while Posey could concentrate on purely baseball. The plan was to erode Greenlee's power and strike when he was at his weakest. But right now, Greenlee seemed unstoppable. It in 1935, he decided that any Crawford player elected by the fans to the East-West game would play for the West squad. The West squad took the field in Kaminsky Park in 1935 and what may be the best lineup of Negro League talent ever assembled with Josh Gibson, Oscar Charleston, Cool Papa Bell, Jimmy Crutchfield, Chester Williamson playing in the same lineup with Willie Wells, Mule Strutter, Alex Ratcliffe, Turkey Stearns, and Ted Trent. The East-West game seemed like a huge mismatch, but in the first inning, the East was up 2-0, and after the fifth inning, they were up 4-0. With the West battling back, the title contest in the ninth inning, and with the East rallying four more runs at the top of the 10th before being tied again, before the West tied it again at the bottom of the 10th. For once, the great embellishment of black press was actually justified, and the West team would win with three-run homer at the bottom of the 11th. The East-West game graduated the Negro Leagues to actual news. The New York Times would make room inside a sports section to mention the game and the paper would go on to do so for future games. Gus Greenlee's Pittsburgh Crawford met the New York Cuban Giants in a Negro League championship crown with Greenlee once again coming out on top with his team winning the league's championship. Gus Greenlee even forgave Satchel Page, swallowing his pride to reconcile their differences. During the 1935 season, Page was taken in by J.L. Wilkerson, but that was only a one-year deal. After that deal was completed, he sought to get back into the league that banned him, with Tom Wilson providing an opening, with Page immediately accepting Tom Wilson's invitation, but it had to be cleared by Gus Greenlee. During the winter season, Page would form his own team with county promoter Johnny Burton to face Major League White Club of Baden area natives, including Ernie Lombardi, Augie Guyan, and a minor leaguer about to join the New York Yankees by the name of Joseph Paul DiMaggio. Page's team was composed mostly of black sandlotters. Page still only gave up three runs. One was from DiMaggio driving in the winning run. The legend of Satchel Page grew, and DiMaggio earned a lot of mileage from the game, maybe facing the best pitcher he would ever face. DiMaggio was so excited to beat Page that he pronounced himself ready to play in New York. While the public spectacle had convinced Page that he was bigger than the sport of black baseball and possibly white baseball too, he realized that he needed a Negro League for top competition and for the money.
Jail Wilkinson would realize that he also needed the Negro League, Greenlee believing that Wilkinson wanted to re-sign Page in 1936, so Greenlee gave JL an incentive not to do so. The Negro League's recognition for the League of Western and Southern Negro Clubs that Wilkinson was planning to get together to form his own league for possible inter-league competition and possibly the reassumption of the Negro League World Series, which was last played in 1927. Greenlee envisioned a new Negro American League to play with the Negro National League with both league as the ultimate order in black baseball. Ironically, as the league became more economically viable, Greenlee felt like it was holding him back because of how much work was involved. While the league had losses of several thousand dollars in 1935, he was able to bank John Henry Lewis drive for the light heavyweight championship. That caused other owners to question Greenlee and discuss that he had taken too much off the top from the East-West game and the league treasurer, the owner of the American Giants, was failing to account for certain league funds. Greenlee was not used to this level of disrespect and fired back at the owner stating that they were not paying their league dues and that he would eject the deadbeats. Greenlee was convinced that Page was about to leave for the white major leagues and after Page's performance in Oakland, rumors of several white league teams might offer black players tryouts. While this never happened and Page was quick to dismiss any major league audition saying, this business of trying us out at the tail end of the season makes me laugh. If they wanted to try out color ball players, they would bring them into training camps the same as the white boys. No sir, I'm not giving up any of my money just to make some owner look good hearted. But rumors like this led to owners pondering contingency plans to hold on to their self-interest, invoking priority clauses. The Negro League had no intention of allowing men like Page and Gibson to be taken from them. If the white major leagues wanted black talent, they would have to take some of the lower level players first to open up a bidding war for the big name stars. Page was a model citizen in 1936 and the first overall vote getter in the East West game. Page was back on Sunday games for the Crawfords and they finished in second place on the first half of the year and finished in first place with a record of 20 and 9 for the second half of the season. Green League would suspend any playoffs that season and would simply declare the Crawfords the league championship. Green League had lost all interest in league affairs anyway as the Denver Post tournament agreed to add another black team to their tournament. Greenlee would form a team called the Negro American All-Stars with Paige Gibson, Cool Papa Bell, and Buck Leonard and sweep his way through Denver in the seven straight games to claim the $5,000 first prize. One of the teams was so worried about Paige that they ordered plastic helmets while batting against Paige, not quite sure they could survive one of his fastballs. In 1936, the league would add the New York Black Yankees to the Negro League. This would open up a brand new New York market and Yankee Stadium property to the league and would also force Greenlee to make some accommodations. The Black Yankees were no longer owned by Bojangles Robinson. He had sold the team in 1932 to a man by the name of James Soldier Boy Similar. He was also a number runner in Harlem and ran the New York Black Yankees into the ground. He faced out salaries and paid players according to the gate that they drew in. Similar had no respect for other teams or his own players. He used to cheat his players and when they would jump to other teams, he would simply sue the other team to get the players back. Still, in 1937, having a team in New York was highly desirable for Greenlee now that the market was wide open because the enemy of black baseball, Nathaniel Strong, had finally made his exit. He had died of a heart attack in 1935. The New York Amsterdam News would state that there was not a man in the country who had made more money from colored baseball than Nathaniel Strong, yet he was the least interest in the welfare of the sport. Even after Nathaniel Strong's death, his second-in-command, William J. Leichner, still remained a minority interest in the Black Yankees and took the operation of Nathaniel Strong's baseball enterprises with black baseball teams still being his booking agency's largest client. Meanwhile, in 1937, the new Negro American League came into existence in the spring of 1937 with venerable teams from the Midwest, the Kansas City Monarchs, and the New York American Giants. Now part of the New York American League, Due to restructuring from Gus Greenlee, from Gus Greenlee and J.L. Wilkerson's non-aggression pact that they had signed in 1936, the league rounded out with the Black Birmingham Barons, the Memphis Red Sox, the Detroit Stars, the St. Louis Stars, along with the Cincinnati Tigers and the Indianapolis Athletics. J.L. Wilkerson would once again stay in the background, with the league's president being handpicked by him, which was a man by the name of Horace G. Hull. But even before 1937. 
Gus Greenlee was beginning to have in his shoes. Inner city had changed and income education had risen and the seedy underground clashed with the middle class families and Greenlee's gaming operation was caught in the middle of all of this. And because of these losses, Greenlee attempted to cut his losses any way it could. Unfortunately, he found a way to offend the game's most important players. Jobs Gibson and Cool Papa Bell have been convinced that Greenlee was trying to treat them like peons. Gibson was so frustrated by Greenlee's refusal to augment his $250 a month salary that he jumped to the homestead of Grays the last few weeks of the 1936 season. Unfazed, Greenlee listed Gibson on the Crawfords and on the 1937 roster and refused to give him a raise, so he held out. At the start of the 1937 season, Gibson was traded for Pepper Bassett and Henry Spearman in $2,500. <laughs> Greenlee would try to attempt to sell this trade to the public by selling Bassett as a replacement to Josh Gibson. And Bassett would do his best hitting 444 in 1937 and earning a starting catcher position at the East-West game. But the damage was done and more damage was coming. Tropical countries had typically conducted their seasons in the winter to draw black and white players to play in paid vacation leagues. But now Cuba, the Dominican Republic and Mexico was beginning to expand their leagues to the summer in direct competition to American baseball. Satchel Page had always been a free agent. Satchel Page, always the free agent, would violate his contract and sign to play summer ball in the Dominican Republic for $6,000. And Page was also hired as an agent for the Los Draconas and was given a cash of American dollars to induce other Crawford players to come and play for the team as well. He was able to get Cool Papa Bell, Leroy Maddock, Sam Bankhead, and Harry Williams and Herman Andrews to leave for over 3000 a man. Greenlee would attempt to reverse his tie by filing court orders, but neither Gus nor the American legal system could touch Rafael Trudeau in the Dominican Republic. With Gus Greenlee's leadership already under fire, Greenlee failed in court to get his players to back to the Negro Leagues. Greenlee would turn to ripping the players ringleader page in the black press stating that page once again had proved himself undependable as a pair of secondhand suspenders and that page and the other players should be barred from the negro league greenlee's authority now morally wounded staggered through a season of hell with the anley greenlee forces growing stronger and stronger after greenlee's dominican republic disaster he began a campaign against the white influences in the negro league vowing to shake off the sinister influence of the great booking agents of the east cumberland Posing would use alienation of white owners to align himself with Ed Gottlieb and Bill Schleichner from the American Giants. Cumberland Posey would be voted in as league secretary and would get his co-owner, Sonny Jackson, elected to the board of directors. Even though Posey lost money in 1937, along with every other team, he was able to form a power block with Posey, similar Gottlieb, and a new owner by the name of Abram Manley from the New York Dodgers against Greenlee, with Greenlee distracted with the Dominican Republic disaster. Midway through the 1937 season, Gus Greenlee was voted out of office with Tom Wilson being voted in as the new league president. Cumberland Posey was now in charge of the Negro League, with Greenlee being only an owner now, but the new Newark ownership would not simply act like a rubber stamp. Abe Manley's wife, Ava Manley, was the one who was really calling the shots. Abe Manley was the money man, but Ava was calling the shots on and off the field. Born in Philadelphia, her white mother cheated on her black father with a white man. So ironically, Ava was a white woman passing as a black woman in black baseball. Ava felt like black baseball to do more for the black race. She was stated in 1936 that the league didn't know its own strength. And if they finally realized the fine things this race was capable of, it would show rapid progress. So she would in January 1937 in league meetings condemn the other owners for the way they did league business. A wonderful future is possible in Negro baseball if we conduct business in a business-like manner instead of being victimized by chaos and petty one-upmanship of the day. Afa Manley created a culture clash and a sexual anxiety within the league. They weren't quite ready for this brash woman within their ranks. One of her main complaints was one that we had heard before, and 
that was the partnership with white booking agencies. She wanted full black control within the league. Abe and Effa would go to war against booking agencies, stating that the league team should do their own booking. And she would receive more attention from white press for her team and black baseball than most of those other players had ever done. Black baseball was ever evolving with new names doing passable imitations for the players that had left for the Dominican Republic. The players believed that they were going to a Caribbean paradise, but in early fall at the end of the baseball season, everyone was dying to get off the island. Rafael Trullo of the Los Dracones had armed guards escorting the American players to and from their hotel to the baseball field with no detours. They didn't understand the language or the customs, so the players had no idea that Trullo was attempting to try to protect them from harm. So during the championship series, the players had to take the field between two rival armies on opposing sides. And this went on like this for a seven game series. At the end of the championship, the American players raced back to their hotels, packed their bag and caught the first boat back to to the states everyone except for page he stayed behind the island and pitching in exhibition games rather than having to beg for his job back in the negro leagues the players that left for the dominican republic didn't need to worry about their lifetime bans because in weeks of their return they were always lo- looking for ways to ease them back into the game the negro players that rebel walked back into the league just in time for the 1938 season with the league assessing nominal fees of one week salary for each of the players Page was a different story though. Manley would offer Greenlee a flat fee for Page of $5,000 and in 1937 Greenlee took the money and considered himself lucky to get a cent for back baseball's problem child. Abe Manley would attempt to protect his investment by obtaining an injunction that forbade Page from playing for any other team. But by the time of the injunction, Page was long gone. He was now playing in a Mexican league for $2,000 a month and left Greenlee out of $5,000 because Page refused to report to Newark. With that, Greenlee attempted to ban Page forever from baseball, but in reality, it was the beginning of the end for Greenlee, who spent the 1938 season reading his exit from the game. Throughout the season, he sold off his best players and hired Jesse Owens to boost ticket prices by staging pregame exhibitions where he would race horses. In 1939, he would close Greenlee Field, leaving the team without a home. He then sold majority interest in the Crawfords to his brother, who then turned and told the team to white businessmen in Toledo, but they never played a game before folding up in 1939. With Gus Greenlee gone, Cumberland Posey and the Homestead Grays had the field to themselves. They would win the league's title every single season from 1938 to 1945, with his steadiness only matched by J.L. Wilkerson's Kansas City Monarchs in the Negro American League. They would win four straight league pennants, establishing themselves as the counterbalance to the Grays in the Negro League. Meanwhile, Page was in Mexico experiencing soreness and stiffness in his pinching arm, attempting to heal himself by throwing even harder but at 32 with years of self-abuse the pain spread to his right shoulder when doctors finally examined the shoulder they told Paige that he would probably never pitch again with rumors of his injury it was not so easy to get around his second lifetime ban while Paige was dealing with his injury, the Mantley saw cracks in Cumberland Posey's power and began to plot against him. Even with the threat of World War II looming at head and major league integration that would change black baseball forever. Thank y'all for listening. This has been One Mike. I'm your host, Country Boy. As always, if you like this, please consider donating to our Patreon page. I have a Buy Me Coffee page, which will allow you to give a one-time donation. Also, review us on Apple Podcasts. Please give us five stars. And lastly, listen to The Cut for all your pop culture needs. Peace.